Ming Chao Lin left Taiwan with her family at the tender age of three for none other than Bloemfontein, South Africa. The author and fluid, fluid brugger has released her second book, Yellow and Confused, which reflects on the reality of being an Asian South African in an unwanted space. So if you've got any questions for Lin, connect, connect with us on our social media platforms and don't forget to use the hashtag Afternoon Express. Ming Chao Lin. Hey, darling. <laughs> what an incredible story. But I want to take it to the very beginning. Yes. What are some of your most vivid memories of moving from Taiwan to South Africa? Honestly, there would be none at all because I was three. How do you rem have memories from that age? Mm. So the problem with that is because society only sees me in a certain way, yet I don't live up to those stereotypes, yes. so to say. And that is when, uh, yeah, all of these misjudgments, you know, come across. And that also takes away um, my identity as in what has been formed, mm. being in South Africa, being groomed in South Africa, mm. assimilation, uh, trying to fit in, trying not to fit in at yeah. the same time. It's, I think it's, it's quite a um, relatable story in that sense. I think a lot of people do feel displaced in their own in different spaces. Absolutely. There's a conflict within you, I think, mm, that happens exactly. when you are told you're born from this country and this nationality and this is who you are. Mm. But at such a young, tender age, you're uprooted, you're kind of plugged from what people would call your core, your foundation, yes. into a completely abstract, alien type of space, which is Bloemfontein, South Africa. <laughs> I mean, how was for you in those years where you have settled down and you now call this home, how, what, what was your general experience like? So, and being very, very young, um, from what I remember, a lot of the times we kind of kept towards ourselves, we kept to the community because it's always the, um, well, the fear of the unknown. Mm. Um, and in those spaces, we found our own acceptance in the sense where we weren't judged for how we looked. We weren't stereotyped for how we looked. But then as soon as you're not in those spaces, um, you become a target for discrimination and racism. And unfortunately, being so early post uh, the um, post apartheid, mm. it's um, it's not gone. Mm. You know, the, the mentality is still there. It's not and like a switch and everyone's converted. No, exactly. And the thing is, it's, it's a progression and a long progression of unlearning. So I think that what Bloemfontein was back then is it was very inviting in a sense, but at the same time, the casual racism, microaggressions, and then you do, of course, get a couple of hardcore racists out there who make sure you know that. Yeah. Um, but Lumfontein was a very interesting experience, mm. and um, coming out of that and now being in Cape Town has also, it's also quite a, like a vast difference, I have to say. As well, as absolutely. Um, you always, you've striced me as someone who is very forward thinking, cutting edge. Um, you know, you don't <laughs> sit back and accept the norms. You kind of dictate your own narrative. As a kid, did you purposefully decide this or did you grow into that? This is something that I had to grow into. So I was basically the def definition of a pick me girl, except not only when it came to uh, gender, but also to, um, to just existing. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem with being such a minority in these kind of spaces is that either you assimilate to what's around you yeah. so that you don't have to stand out so much, but when you do stand out anyway, it kind of screws around with that. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was very young, a lot of it was assimilation. I wanted to be like everyone else. You know, you didn't want to stand out because, you know, someone's going to yeah. laugh at you and look at your lunchbox and say, oh, did you bring dog today? You know, yeah. like it's... It's very unnecessary stereotypes that are extremely harmful and to... And hurtful. Especially for the psychologi um, psychology of a young child just of trying course. to grow in that space. So I wasn't prepared. My parents, being first-generation immigrants, yeah. they didn't grow up with this type of um, judgment, this type of racism or psychological wow. issues. And so for us, the children of their generation, Mm. we were the first ones to experience this. So even our parents couldn't prepare us Absolutely. You know, for the kind of spaces that we were going to yeah. be in. And you've now decided to kind of take what makes you so unique, what makes you so different, and you've jotted it down. This is your second book now. Yes. And first of all, the title in itself, <laughs> Yellow and Confused, is very honest and very, <laughs> very powerful. Why was it so important for you to tell your story? Um, I started writing a couple of years ago. Well, firstly, it, it started with my food blog, Butterfingers, yes. and it was about honoring my heritage, honoring my parents and the, uh, the recipes that they passed down onto us, obviously. Mm -hmm. And what I realized that 
I didn't have recipes that were accessible um, to me. And back then, like, internet was still pretty much new-ish in yeah. terms of blogging and all that kind of stuff. So I was part of the first generation of food bloggers in South Africa. Mm. And um, from there, I started meeting more people and discovering more things. And at the same time, I was working a full-time job as a copywriter in agencies. Oh, wow, okay. So being from the, the back end of where content comes from, mm. being on the advertising side, you see the problems of advertising that allows perpetuation of stereotypes, yes. that causes harmful thinking. And obviously, none of it is intentional, but there's a very major difference between intent versus effect. Mm. And I think that as in media, wow. it's, it's almost a responsibility to make sure that we uncover what the effect is going to be, even though our intent is not what, what it is, yeah, what we planned for it to be. And for yourself, you've definitely taken that um, intent and you're very intentional about how you're going to raise your little daughter. I know yes. yourself <laughs> and your husband, Kyle, have a baby girl. Yes. And you now have this very unique opportunity to take your lessons, things yes. that your parents weren't equipped with, yes. things that your parents might not have even known would be an issue. Um, and you're able to put it in your own words, narrate it and teach the little one. For you, what is something that's going to be crucial, a standout moment that you want to teach your daughter in terms of identifying herself, her culture and her heritage? It's really about, I want her to have the choices. Mm. I want her to have the options of knowing that she can be what she wants to be and not have society dictate what she needs to be, whether it's culturally, whether it's racial, whether it's um, societal. It's I want to make sure that she has the choices. And I think that that's what we didn't have growing up. And I think you can relate a lot in that sense as well. Absolutely. Um, with your background. like. The yeah. fact that we couldn't relate to those around us yeah. made us think that we only have so many options. Our only choices are to be a certain way, to act a certain way in order to get further ahead. Yes. And I want to teach her because this is something that South Africa has allowed, uh, it's given me the privilege to, to be yes. in these spaces and learn, is that to be unapologetically yourself. Absolutely, unapologetic if you are, and you are shining that light so bright for your little one to follow. Now, we've definitely asked South Africa if they've got any questions for Ming, and we've got Unomonde Nlovu here who says, how did you know that you had a passion for food, and when did you start your blog? Um, so. I think that I've always loved food. My dad taught me to, um, well, I have his palate and he enjoys food so much. So a lot of it was being out of, being in college, being away from my parents, and then also having to, wanting to have that comfort, that sense of home. Mm. And the fact that they weren't around, like, what can you do? And food is one of the closest languages that allows you to communicate yeah. that, that fondness, that familiarity, that love for your culture. And so in college, I always used to cook and everyone, all the Asians would come and come over to my house and then I would feed everyone. Um, so so you're the feeder. <laughs> I was the feeder. <laughs> um, and then over the years, I realized that they were asking, stop, people started asking me for the recipes. And wow. so I decided to uh, put them up on a blog. I learned how to code a little bit uh, by watching YouTube videos and I made my own little simple WordPress blog and wow. it started from there. So. As time went by, it got bigger and bigger. I got more features. And then I realized that it's, it wasn't just about the recipes. It was also about the stories that came with them yeah. and wanting to be represented on a plate, wanting to be represented in the spaces around you. Mm. Um, just back to when I started my blog, I started it in 2011. Wow. Um, so it's quite a couple of years ago. Quite a couple yeah. of years ago, but you've done so much for the platform. Thank you so much. You're not going anywhere. We're having you at the end of the show. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Ming. Thank you.